There's so much good shit going on in life. Family, friends, what else do you need? Yeah. Like, and it's like, stop looking at what's better or getting the shits with people that are rude to you. Mm -hmm. Focus in on... I sell mid-range 750k houses. Yeah. If you were selling that, would you still do social media? 100%. So there's two parts with advertising, whether it be social media or print media. There's selfless and selfish. So the selfless part is... So you've mastered the market, but now you want to start winning for yourself. I'm Daniel Lee. Some know me as real estate's funny guy, but in the Get Keen podcast, we get down to business and explore what gets people really keen, how to get the most out of your real estate career, how to build a successful business and live the best life for yourself and your family. We'll uncover how to be hugely successful in real estate, setting you up to get keen and make the next big move in your life. Welcome along to the Get Keen Podcast. Yes, I'm very keen for today. I got the big dog in. I called the kennel and said, give me your biggest dog. And they sent me Matt Lank. That's a good joke. You like that? Thanks, Brad. That's very, very kind. <laughs> I'm very excited to have Matt here. I've known him for a long time. And everyone in Brisbane and Queensland, if you're in real estate, you've heard the name Matt Lancashire. He is one of Ray White's elites. That's probably not even... Like, that's probably the mid-range, the elite. You're the next level. That's you know? fine, mate. That's yeah, all, yeah. all right. Um, but, you know, number one in Queensland, probably up there in the top three Ray White agents in, in the whole of Australia uh, and a very recognisable name. Deals a lot in the high-end uh, property market, uh, which so many agents aspire to get to. And so I want to talk a little bit about that, but I'm going to get so much out of that. And, and I know what a busy guy you are. So thanks very much for your time today, Absolute mate. Absolute pleasure, Dan. Thanks for having me. No worries at all. Mate, I want to get into it and I want to know your history in real estate because uh, you are like just one of those guys who it's just year on year. You just see that progression. I've seen it myself. You've been in real estate. Like you're someone I always looked up to when I first got into real estate because I would see your name a lot and I would go to you know, every conference that was on and you were always there speaking and giving your insights and you just progressively have always gotten better. But take us back to the beginning. How did you get into real estate? What did you do before? Did you know that that was the journey you wanted to go on? Absolutely not. No, it was um, sort of Bradbury into real estate actually. So uh, I finished school in 98, so probably a couple of years ahead of you. What are you? Yeah, uh, 2001. There you go. Yeah. So mate, much older. I know. Wiser as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, I went to school at St. Lawrence's here in Brisbane. Um, you know, school was an interesting thing for me. I, I've, I wasn't the studious type. So uh, my father, come from quite a bright family. My father's a surgeon. My brother's a surgeon. My sister's a teacher. And my mother was a detective with a juvenile aid. So um, it and was- And you're the dead shit. Dead shit. <laughs> Absolute dead shit. Um, and um, there, look, there are a lot of jokes around the, the Christmas- table talking about what happened to me and oh, he's dropped on his head, a few other little <laughs> things that they, they, they like to, um, to give me shit about. But um, look, I just, I just had a different skill set when I was at school. And um, unfortunately, at that point in time, school didn't, or the education program didn't really tailor to my, uh, my strengths, which was emotional intelligence, bit of EQ. Um, and it was all about books. What are you going to do? Like, what, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? And one of my things was you finish school at a young age, at 17 years old. And I find the whole careers position at the school really fascinating. Mm. Like, oh, here you go. What are you going to do for the rest of your life? At 17 years old, how do you know? Um, you totally don't. I remember. I didn't like, you know, you just, I ended up going to uni because that's what you do. You go to uni, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do or anything. Just kind of picked business. Like, yeah, business will take me somewhere. Well, yeah, what is business? But I'm 17. I'm learning about hierarchies inside yep. a massive structure of a business. Like, I care about that. I cared about, you know, getting drunk on the weekend and picking up chicks. Yep, exactly. Wasn't very good at dollar, that. Dollar, dollar, <laughs> dollar drinks at, um, in the city. What was it called? The, uh, like, yeah. I think there was a place called the Dome. Yeah, the Dome, get... and then they introduced GST, and then they become a dollar ten drinks, oh, mate. Then it was drinking <laughs> at home after that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I finished then, and I was like, I tried really hard at school. Like I actually tried hard, but I, I just didn't have that capacity to be able to. I, I remember going into grade eleven where you could choose a couple of subjects that you wanted to do, and it was um, one of them because I wanted to act like I was a little bit smarter. I chose biology. Okay. Which was very bizarre. Yeah. Anyway, um, and failed that. I, you know, <laughs> and I, I got an OP sixteen. So, and that was trying really uh, hard. So, for those that don't know the OP score, it's not even around anymore. It's from one to twenty five, with one being the best. And, and if you get above 
15. 15. <laughs> yeah. It's you're, not great. You're kind of the guy that doesn't tell anyone what OP you got. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. But I, I actually tried and yeah. still got a 16. Um, and so just school wasn't for me. So I remember finishing school and um, it, it, I was playing a lot of tennis at that point in time and playing tennis with all my mates. I was working one night a week at the Night Owl uh, in Annerley, um, which was which was pretty good. It was a um, bit of flexibility yeah. there, you know, three hours on a, on a, on a Wednesday night. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it got to a point where my parents said, hey, what are you doing with your life? Like enough's enough. My brother was studying medicine. My sister was studying teaching. And what are you going to do? And I remember they said, oh, look, there's this, I saw this thing in the paper. It's a careers day for trades. You should go and have a look. And so we went to the convention center and there was all these stalls and stands around for, you should be an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, what a boiler maker, whatever it might be. And literally my parents said, you should choose one. And so I literally covered my eyes and picked one. And um, I got myself into an electrical trade, believe it or not. So I'm a qualified electrician. Wow. Which do you still, would you still know how to do Absolutely not. No, no. no okay. I actually drive past a couple of houses that I wired up back in the day and I'm surprised <laughs> they're still there, to be honest. So I was a really bad electrician. But what I learned, which is really um, valuable to me today, is you know learning how a house is put together mm. and being able to do that and having that skill set has been a really good skill, um, transferable skill that 100%. I've been, been able to learn bring into a real lot estate. Of like yeah, about what they're, what's happening inside a house. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I finished my trade pretty quickly because I didn't like it. So I'd, I went extras and did all the did all the uh, study really quickly. Um, and I just knew that that wasn't the direction for me. Um, one thing it did do is uh, I moved out of home when I was 17 years old uh, and with my best mate from school, we ended up buying a, um, a house together. So we bought a house at 17 on apprentice wages and every weekend nice. we'd have working bees and do all those sorts of things. And that was in Tarragindi. I uh, paid 167500 for it back in the day. Between you? Between us, oh, yeah, 50-50. Okay. So yeah. it's uh, and sort of struggled along doing that, but did it up. Um, I finished my trade and decided to go overseas. So I did two years over in London. Um, um, and it got to a point when I was over there, um, I needed the cash. I ran out of money. And so I rang my mate and I said, look, we, we should sell the house. So we put this house on the market. There was an agent uh, at that point of time by the name of Flo Chapman. Uh, she was a Ray White agent in in the Tarragindi area and her slogan was go with the flow. Oh, so I like that. You would like, you would like, of all I people, you of would like that. <laughs> That is not, I like that. I'm going to call Flo. So, so where are you? Where'd you go? She's no longer in real estate. It's but she, Yeah, but um, she would be good for Plum now though, I reckon. I'll get her Come in. Come in, get her in, go with the Flo. Go with the I fly. reckon bring it back. Bring bring back the Flo. Um, and um, Hazley Cush, who is a, a good family friend of ours. I've known Hazley for 40 years. So he went to school with my older brother, um, went to kindy together. And um, Hazley was the auctioneer. And we decided to put the house on the market and um, we ended up having a huge amount of groups through, like 100 groups through. I was on the phone. We set a reserve, went to auction with it. Uh, we had oh, like 10 registered bidders and um, it didn't sell. So we said, where do we need to set the reserve? She told us it didn't sell. And um, four weeks went past and I really needed the cash. So I rang my mate and I said, what are we going to do here? I flew back from overseas, came and... Um, and um, met with Flo, met with my mate, and I said, what do we need to do to get this house sold? And she just said, no one wants to buy it. And I said, well, do you mind if I just ask a question? Do you mind if I get a list of all the people that have been through out of desperation, because they needed the cash? And I called everyone and got three offers and and sold it for over what the reserve was. You're kidding. Nah, dead set. That is a joke, no way. 100%. So, and I was like, oh, geez, really? And then back burner, went overseas, uh, made a bit of money as a young bloke overseas and um, blew all the cash Yes, um, and decided time's up, need to come home. I hadn't been home for two Christmases. My parents were like, and I'm really close with my family. And they said, oh, you know, we should come home. You should come home. So I came home and I was like, "What? what's next? And I was looking for all these ideas. And I knew back at school, I, there was always, I, was, I knew I'd always land on my feet, but I just didn't know what I was going to do. And it sure as hell wasn't being an electrician. So I ended up, um, I wanted to come back and start a shoe store. Yeah. So I went, met with Hazley um, and said, look, I've got this idea. I want to um, start a shoe shop. And it was like, my aspiration was like an Aquila sort of shoe shop. You know what right. I mean? Are you just into your shoes? I used to yeah. be, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I used to be. And it was um, a bit of a fad at that point in time. Mm-hmm. But it's, mm-hmm. um, okay. 
and ended up um, saying to Hayes, let's catch up. And Hayesley at that point in time, he was the chief auctioneer for Ray White and he just bought this business called Ray White New Farm. Um, and it was number 180 in Ray White, Queensland. So it was a broken business. No mm. one wanted to buy it. And much the same as your office here, he had 700 square meters of space with four salespeople. <laughs> hey, and, I got more than that. Yeah, I know. You got a lot more than that. And, <laughs> hey, uh, you're underselling me here, man. <laughs> and he um, said, you know what? Rather than sh starting your shoe shop, what you should do, she should get into real estate. You'd be a good salesperson. And at that point of time, this is what was fascinating. It was at a point of time, well, this is what he told me. He might have been bullshitting me. I don't know. But he said that there's no legislation around paying debit wet, debit credit wages. So it's like, and I needed a job. I So I decided to start with Hayes. And it was probably the toughest nine months of my whole life at that point of time because moved home from overseas. I, blew, I made a lot of money through selling a house. I blew all my money overseas. I started in real estate, which I really had no experience in except for, you know, selling the house at, um, at Tarragindi. Mm. And um, it took me nine months to make my first sale. Nine months. Like, yeah. I was really bad. Oh, wow. Okay, so you didn't start as a sales associate? No, start as a no, full-blown agent. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. That's, not, that's the hardest way to start. Hardest way to start. And it was at a point where the office had zero market share. Mm -hmm. It was a brand new office. Mm -hmm. It was a failing, failed office. There were four salespeople. I was the fifth with all this space. Here's your desk. Here's your phone. Here's your market. Good luck. Um, and literally it took me nine months to make the first sale. Interesting thing about the first sale was um, it fell over. Mm. And then an agent in the office at that point of time said, hey, I got to buy for it. But look, how about, I know you need the money. So how about we've changed the split? 80 to me, 20 to you. And, <laughs> oh, good, good and, I, took, and I took the you deal. Took, it. took the deal. But um, the nine months went by. I moved home. I had no money. Um, and this is for something, and I don't know whether people that are listening to this can resonate with this, but it was probably the best thing that happened to me. But also it was a real struggle at that point of time. I ended up, um, I was quite proud and I didn't, I moved home with my parents. I'd been out of home since 17. Mm. Uh, I was 24. Mm -hmm. Um and zero cash. I got myself into $50,000 credit card debt. Yeah. Um, and I don't know about you, but if you've been in a position where you've had that position of debt, it's really hard to see your way out of it. Mm. And at um, that point of time, I had no structure. I had no real skill set mm -hmm. around selling real estate and I was struggling. Mm. And all of my family and friends were always like, hey, just go back to being an electrician. It's okay. It's, mm -hmm. Real estate's not for you. Mm. Uh, being a proud person I am, I don't like to fail in things. And um, it got to a point where literally $50,000 credit card debt, it gets to a point where you go, what do I need to do to get myself out of this? And um, it was it was a really big struggling part of my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm really grateful that I went through that because I knew I, I got out of it, Yeah, obviously. And um, But what had happened was being a real estate agent new into an industry with no money you have to work out how to make it work. Yeah. And it's um, there was a, a couple of pivotal moments that happened, if you want me to discuss those. I'd love that. So um, I started to get some runs on the board. Um, it was a really tough point in the market because there was the the boom, which had happened in 07, 08. Yeah. No stock, much the same as COVID. Mm -hmm. Listings went down from, you know, they, they went down 50%. Mm -hmm. All the top agents in in the market were getting the lion's share of those listings. Then this thing called GFC hit, um, and GFC was diabolical. Like it was, there was no money. Yeah. And um, I'm grateful to go through the boom, but I went through the boom at the wrong time. Yeah. But then I was also grateful to go through the bust because it was so hard. But then you sort of know how to manage your way through it when if it ever came again. Exactly. Um, and um, it got to a point where I started to get some, you know, runs on the board. I was just chipping away at this debt, right? And I'd, I'd go from 50,000 to 40,000, then I'd be chasing off market sales. They wouldn't come through, then I'd get the shits, then I'd be like, maybe I do go back to being an electrician. Um, and I made this decision and it was like, what do I need to do to make this work? Because there was no plan B, being an electrician was not a plan B for me. And, and I sort of was really enjoying real estate, but I just didn't really get it. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the pivotal thing that happened to me was I, I made a call to all the top agents down south 
So there was a couple of agents. There was one in particular, which I spent 15 minutes of my time with him. His name was James Dack. I'm not sure if you ever remember James mm, Dack. No, I can't. So Ben Collier, who's the uh, agency guy, one of yeah. the top agents mm -hmm. in the country, he was his associate at that okay. point of time. Uh, and so I rang my mum and dad and said, look, I need to borrow some money. Um, and they had no idea of my financial position. Right. So I was a bit embarrassed about it. So I borrowed a thousand dollars. I bought a flight to Sydney, bought a new suit, bought some new shoes, just so I'd look a bit more presentable because my yeah. shoes had holes in it, my pants had holes in it and just, um, got myself into $51,000 credit card debt. <laughs> um, and for anyone that knows this is, I hope the Combank's not listening to this, but this is how diabolical it was at this point. I actually had to, um, uh, won't say lie. Um, I had to sort of say to a bank that, you know, oh, I don't have any other debts and I got another credit card to pay a credit card loan. So it was, yeah. it was fucking bottom of the barrel, man. Yeah. Like it was hard. Um, so I went down to Sydney and I met this guy, James Dack, and I, I got there about four hours early and he was meeting me in this little cafe in, in Wallara and there was a paper that services the Eastern suburbs of Sydney called the Wentworth Courier. I'm not sure if you've seen yeah. it. Start opening this paper. And I just looked through the property section. James Dack, James Dack, James Dack, James Dack. Twenty pages, and I was like, "Far out! This guy like must be better than I thought he was." And um, I met with him, and I had fifteen minutes, and I started to try and have a bit of conversation. He goes, "Mate, you got fifteen minutes. What do you want to know?" Um, and I said, "Okay, well, what do I need to do to be successful?" And he said, "You got to do five things," and I said, okay, beautiful. What is it? He goes, the first one is um, you need to own the own the paper. You need to own the market. If it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Mm -hmm. That's what I've done. It's what built up my business. He goes, the second part is you need to be an auction agent. You need to only do auctions. You can control the time. You can control the amount of stock you've got. You can and you can control effectively control the market when you're doing that. He said, the third thing is you need to get become systemized and structured. You need to be every, you need to allocate every piece of time in your day from your working time from eight o'clock to five o'clock. There's no downtime. You need to make sure that you do that. And the other thing was uh, you need to be a hard, you need to outwork your competition and hard work. Yeah. And it was interesting. I flew back to um, Brisbane and Hazley's like, man, I was pumped. Yeah. And it was interesting. And as, and one of the reasons why I like doing these podcasts as well and doing things like this and doing training sessions for other people is like sort of, it's all about light bulb moments, right? Like you've got to be ready to hear it. Mm. And everything that I'm going to talk about today, it's probably not dissimilar to every other guest that you've had on the podcast saying the same thing, but saying it in a different way, mm. right? And so I went to our first sales meeting and I stood up in front of, you know, the 10 people in our 700 square meters of space. Hayes is like, mate, you sound like a different person. What have you learned? What'd you learn in Sydney? Give us the sprinkle of magic dust. And I stood up and I said, get ads in the paper, go to auction, have a systemized structured business and work hard and sat down. And Hazley's like, mate, that's what that's real estate training, Ray White training yeah. 101. You've been told that already. <laughs> but what was really interesting is I took it really seriously. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I was, I think there's a point where you're on the absolute bones of your ass and you don't have a plan B where sometimes you need to hear something in a different way for you to do it. Mm. And the first call I made when I got back was to a lady by the name of Kylie Curtis from the Career Mail. And she was our, uh, our Career Mail rep. And I said to her, I want to be the number one Kuru Mail advertiser mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. That was at a time when one page, one full page in the Kuru Mail, have a guess how much it is for one full page per Back week. Back then? Yeah. I remember I would never, I could never get people to pay it. Yeah. Um, $17,000 <laughs> per yeah, week per ad. Insane. You got one in the paper and one in the Brisbane News for that. The, the layover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And um, Does so- Does Brisbane News still exist? No. Nah. No, nah, okay. No. Nah. So it's, um, and that- was my number one goal. Mm. And um, so I went into full overdrive as soon as I um, got back. So I looked at all of the points. I said, I want to be the number one career mail advertiser, right? That was number one. Number two is I'm only going to take things to auction. Number three, I sat down and I rewrote my whole strategy. Did a, uh, I call, It's an ideal week, but I call it my perfect week. Mm -hmm. And I didn't deviate from the activities. Mm -hmm. And four, I just made sure that I worked my absolute ass off. And um, there was an agent in our office at that point of time. His name was Salvatore Vastor or Adam Vastor at the point of time. 
and I used to watch him. He was a massive prospector. Mm-hmm. And so I'd just, I'd tally Adam's calls, my calls, mm-hmm. and I'd just tally all day. And mm-hmm. when he'd leave at seven o'clock at night, I'd make 10 more calls mm-hmm. before I'd go home. And it was a, and the hard work thing I think is a really, it, I, I don't like the word hard work. Yeah. It's just too loose. Well, it's hard to, you know, hard work to someone is um, not that hard to someone else. Well, they think hard work's really hard. <laughs> they think hard work's time in the office. Yeah. It's absolute bullshit. It's, yeah. It should be a productive time in the office. Mm. And um, there was a graph I saw the other day. It was, it was beautiful. I'll send it to you. Mm-hmm. And it was this thing about, you know, work hard now. Easy later. Oh, yeah. Have you seen yeah, that? Yeah, I've seen that. And then there's the dude climbing, climbing up. Yeah. yeah. And, mate, it's so it's true. It's so true. So true. And it's um, the one thing that I wish that I did differently is that I wish I got that earlier mm. because it wasn't until I was on the absolute bones of my ass, and I'm grateful that that happened, that I actually learned how to do things and restructure everything. And I wrote a full plan. I'd sit in the office every night, write all my, rewrite my letters, write out how I'm going to prospect, mm. write out all of, and mate, I went out and door knocked in New Farm, Newstead, Tenerife. There's about just under 2,000 homes in that area mm-hmm. there. I've door knocked them 30, 40 times. Yeah. So, and I started on, you know, we'd go on RP Data or Price Finder, and I'd start on A and go down the A's and people would just go street by street around Mm. because it was easier. Mm. I'd finish the A, go to the next A, get in my car, drive down to the next A. So I'd actually physically learn it, wrote notes on every house, wrote everything, tried to build relationships Mm -hmm. with people. And what was interesting, three months of doing that, people started to see you. Mm. People started to notice what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I'd do my own letterbox dropping, do all my own letters, Mm -hmm. go door knocking every day, inviting them to open homes. One of the things, um, one of the things that I did back in the day was before an open home on a Saturday, I'd stand on J- James Street. This is before Calar was there. Mm-hmm. I'd stand on the James Street at the Zebra Crossing there where the cinema is, yeah. handing out brochures to my Saturday open home. Oh, wow. And it was just about, you know, and this is one thing that, that James Dack said is not who you know it, who who knows you. Yeah. And that was instrumental into everything that's um, how it's how it's going now huge i love that story and and you know it's funny you said oh i'm probably just saying the same thing everyone else says in a different way kind of but everyone's got their own story but it is fascinating to me that i've had some really great agents like high high performers on this podcast and every single one of them has a story about when they were nothing and where they were broke they were on the bones of their ass and it took something like it took a moment like that to make them ch- yep. make the change. Yep. And, you know, I, I don't know if I was as bad as you in debt, but I did have that moment too back home living with my parents in debt, no money, like no car. It was like money meant so much to me because, you know, when you're that broke, you value it so much. Totally. You know, like yep. a $300 bonus for being part of this sale when I was a sales associate. I was like so stoked, you know, yep. I got 300 bucks. And I put it all away, and being that broke once, and and fighting your way to get out of it, um, it's so valuable to be in that position. Totally. And- well, you learn you learn lessons of, and that's probably the hardest thing with the the mo- agency model now is an associate comes in, they get paid their wage, they get paid bonuses, they don't actually know what it's like to fight for it. Yeah. You know, like it's, and that's the one lesson that I see so time and time again. And then, and I see associates go into businesses and they think, oh, well, I'm just going to go out my own. And they do it too early and they're out of the industry. Yeah. Well, they also like when you're an associate, the leads, the, the, the leads that are coming in is everything that that team or that lead agent has been doing for three, four, five years prior. Yeah. And they're, not going out and actually experiencing cold, hard prospecting, the knockdown yep. consistently, yep. like on your own as well. When you're in a team, it's like not as hard. But when you're on your own and you're just getting knocked back, knocked back, knocked back, you got to have that resilience. And like that sounds to me like what you did better than everyone else in your office. Right? Well, it's I wanted it more, I think. Mm. And then, you know, like like you said, the knockback, not only that, it's like getting chased out of houses by little old Italian ladies with brooms. Yeah. Like that's that's literally like when I was... <laughs> that still happens to me. Oh, but... <laughs> but and... I'm not there to sell the house. I'm just, you know, looking for a <laughs> just <snooping>. DVD player. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like one of those things that it's... The, it's, it's 
that hard work part is what a lot of people miss. And I think that there's a, I think there's four stages to real estate. So do you mind if I go into those now? Mate, please. Probably going off script. No, no, there's no scripts. There's no scripts. So the first one is the learning phase, right? Mm -hmm. So the learning phase can be anywhere between one and four years. And what I think that a lot of people don't see in real estate is I, I use an analogy a lot about look at lawyers and law firms, right? So an associate in a law firm goes in, they've got to do four years of study, right? Four years, university, every light you see on in the city buildings at, at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night is the associates working there. They get paid nothing. They get forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. They work their ass off and that's a four-year process in a university degree. Agents that are associate or associates that come to businesses, they they can go and be an associate for two or three years, come out the other end and make whatever they want. Yes, I know. And it's um and they don't see it as that learning phase. They don't take it seriously. Like one of the things I always ask our associates in our business is when's the last time you've read a contract from back to front? Yeah. I mean, if you ask me. It's mate, they don't. I don't yeah, they don't. They don't. Well, yeah, they don't even. I mean, most agents, to be honest, don't even don't understand e the the full form six and contract in Queensland. Hundred really. percent, I yeah. agree with that. And um, so that learning phase is, it's it's a one. It's a. I reckon it's really a two to four year process, right? Then if you go out to be your own agent, it's the it's sort of like the breakthrough period, which is it's hard. You come out and be an associate from an associate into onto your own as your own agent. You've got a do everything yourself. You don't have the assistance from PAs generally until you can earn enough money. Then there's the point of, I call it the acceptance stage, which is, okay, well, I'm actually doing really well here. You know, probably a three to 500 rider. I'm doing mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. really well. Mm -hmm. And then there's two parts to that. There's a part where they go, and this is something that a lot of people don't talk about. The part of, do I want this? You know, because mm -hmm. in Ray White, there's a thing called elite performers. It's just gone up to 750000 in gross fees. There is a huge rate of, of people that hit elite once. Really? And drop off. It's like a it's like a 40% drop off rate. Ah. So they do it once. Yeah. And that, I believe, comes down to, do I really want this? Do, am I prepared to do what it takes to maintain that? Am I worthy of this? So it's the fear of, the fear of um, success. And the fear of failure. And I think that's a, a really interesting thing to talk mm. about. Then it gets to a point where you hit that and you go, yeah, do you know what? I deserve this and I like it. I'm going to give it a red hot crack. Then it's called the sacrifice stage. Mm. And the sacrifice stage is probably where a lot of people aren't prepared to do that. So working their ass off until 11 o'clock at night, being productive, missing out on parties, missing out on... Uh, um, weddings and all of those sorts of things. And one of my things in my sacrifice stage was I remember my own 30th birthday party. Uh, it was at Cha 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 in the city mm. and I had all my mates go. It, it was booked for 6.30 and I was in deal zone. And I remember it was a, a property on James Street and I had an offer on this property. The owners weren't home. I knew that if I called them, they wouldn't have me there. So I text the boys and said, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be late. I'm really sorry, get started. And at 7.30, already an hour late to my own thing, I went and knocked on these owners' doors with the contract in hand, went into the house, sat there for 40 minutes, came back outside, gave them some time to think about it, went back inside, did the deal. I rocked up to my own, at my own 30th birthday at 8 o'clock and my mates were absolutely filthy, like filthy with me. Yeah. And it wasn't until I had our Miss 40th, we got our 40th cancelled last year, I hired a house down in Byron Bay and had all my mates come and stay and we're sitting around at, at like a big fire at night time and a couple of the boys brought up, remember when you were late to your own 30th? We get it. We get now get it. Yeah. And it's that's the sacrifice thing. So even weddings, right? I'd go to, we had the wedding seasons and my, my sacrifice stage was 27 through to 33. Yeah. That was like where I was like, burnt through girlfriends, like dirty underwear. I'd have people like, I'd miss parties. I'd miss things. My family would be like, oh, I haven't heard from you. And, but I just knew that if I did that hard work for that period of time, mm. it's going to become easier mm -hmm. and it's going to be worth it. Mm -hmm. And so weddings, I'd go to the, I'd go to the, the church, go to the, um, go to the ceremony, go straight back to the office, make all the calls. Everyone would go for the drinks. I'd then go back to the office, do all my callbacks again, and I'd ring my mates or text my, hey, when do you reckon the bridal party will be there after photos? So I wouldn't miss them coming in to the wedding. 
yeah, and that wow. was and then back in it on Sunday morning. Yeah. And that was a five years of sacrifice. And you know what? People always ask me, is it worth it? Fucking oath it's worth mm. it. And mate, most people are not prepared to do that to get to that next level. Hey guys, just quickly, if you're loving this content and you're a real estate agent that's already thinking what it might be like to have your own real estate business and brand, then check out the show notes. There'll be a link to our Plum Partners website where you can leave an inquiry and me or one of my team members will reach out. We help agents to create, run and grow their own real estate business and brand so they can earn more and set up a better future for themselves. So get keen, get in touch. Now let's get back to the episode. 100%. That short-term pain for the long-term gain. Mate, it's and like... now, you know, 10 years on and you are reaping the rewards. And obviously you get into those next stages because you build the foundation, you build some profile. Now you can afford a team to help you because when you're on your own, it's all you. It's all you. You know what I mean? Like yep. you can't go and splurge 90K on a great EA when you're brand new and you're 23, yep. you know? 100%. Like Agreed. you got to you got it's all on your own and it's a lot of rejection. So you say like you were knocking on doors and this is back in the old school, right? It's it's changed these days. We you're coming from this place. I remember, you know, there was no social media then. It was it was the real down and dirty prospecting that, you know, we all we all know and love the the older generation. Yep. Um, you know, the door knocking, the cold calling, the getting in front face to face as much as possible. How long did it take you, you know, from that moment where you came back and you said, Righto, time for me to double down, time for me to actually do this. Yep. How long did it take you to like? What were you doing prospecting wise, and when did you start to notice a change? Okay, so my number one goal was to become the Kurumal ad, number one mm. Kurumal advertiser. Mm. Imagine being the the highest priced property I'd sold was about six hundred and ninety thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So imagine that, and then coming into someone's house and dropping a forty five thousand dollar marketing campaign yeah. for a full page. <laughs> And at that point of time, we're we're regulated on fees. We're capped at um, what was it, eighteen five percent of the first eighteen thousand plus two point five of the remainder. So our fees were capped at that. So not only getting the full fee because it was like you know that was our maximum we could charge. Yeah. Getting that, then dropping a forty five thousand dollar marketing campaign was difficult. Yes. Um, and I remember there was one client um, who was on James Street, another property on James Street in New Farm, where I saw a sign go up. And a sign go down real quick. And so I went and knocked on their door and said, oh, what happened? And it was with another Ray White that wasn't from our area. And they said, if you, that we never deal with Ray White again. They're scumbags, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, well, look, I want to just talk to you about what I can do for you, blah, 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 and just hustled on them for a month, right? Mm -hmm. This is one thing, and this is, I hope it's not too off track, but most agents that don't have the experience they should be getting an experienced agent in to help them get the listing and splitting it with them to learn their processes. So, or use your principal, take your principal in. Mm -hmm. And um, I went in and I rang Hazley and I said, look, I need you. I'm going in and I'm to this house. It's a big one. I've only sold her 690,000. This one was circa 3 million bucks. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the owner said to me, whatever you do, if you bring that career mail advertising with you, I'm going to kick you out of my house. And my goal was to be the number one career mail advertiser. And I was like, man, this is my shot to do this. And so folded it up, put it right at the bottom <laughs> of the box, went in and Hazley said to me, don't take it. Do not take it. And um, so I took it anyway yeah. and went into the meeting. It all went really well. We were having this great you know, conversation, talking about how we can get the best price for them. And then they said, okay, look, what, what's the marketing look like? And I pulled out my career mail advertiser, my career mail and he said, I told you I'd kick you out. And I was like, well, look, let's look at the stats. Let's talk about this. And anyway, got got a full page campaign for three weeks. And um, what was really interesting with that was they had a failed, it was up for like literally seven days. Yeah. I ended up going in, getting the ads. We had close to 200 people through, this, uh, through the three weeks of inspections, seven registered bidders at auction, and we sold it for 2.85 under the hammer at auction. Wow. And that was my story, right? Yeah. Then 
what happened after that was it was just a transferable story to the next one, yeah. to the next one, to the next one, and the momentum built built really quickly. Mm. So it was when people weren't pitching it and people weren't doing it, my name became more recognizable. The si- uh, the sales became more recognizable. Mm-hmm. So there's two parts with advertising, whether it be you know social media or whether it be print media. Um, there's two parts to it. There's selfless and selfish. So the selfless part is I know that if I – and today I'm still – my one of my KPIs is to have five to ten pages a week in the Courier Mail. Mm-hmm. And I know that if I'm in the Courier Mail, I get more eyeballs on it. Mm-hmm. I get more inspections. Mm-hmm. I get more um, offers. I get more registered bidders, which means my sellers get a better price. Mm-hmm. So I don't deviate from that, right, because I know that it works and it's given me – my whole career has been built on competition creating and doing that. For sure. And so what happens is on the sel- in the selfless side, I just know that if I do realestate.com, domain.com, my EDM that goes out to my database, the social media with paid, um, uh, paid um, what's it called, advertising behind it, mm-hmm. uh, courier mail, everything, letterbox dropping, you name it, magic 50s to uh, get more buys in, calling through the database of old inspections, mm-hmm. I know that there's no one in the market that's going to miss this property that's looking for a property like that. Yeah. And I'll get a better price for my vendors. Yeah. The byproduct of that and the selfish side is you go in the paper there, your name becomes recognizable. Mm-hmm. So you could have 10 pages in the courier mail every single week. You might mm-hmm. not sell a thing, but to the market perception, you're killing it. Mm-hmm. Right. But I know that that's not the fact because I know that I sell everything. Yeah. So it's actually a win win for the client and for us yeah. as well. Yeah. That's the beauty of, you know, what we're really lucky in in real estate, and I say, say this all the time with social media and why agents don't do social media. I mean, and, and, and with, you know, newspaper advertising, it works exactly the same. We are in such a fortunate industry where w- the, the sellers pay to advertise their own properties and then we get a benefit out of it too. You know, it's it, it, the benefit is for them because our job is to get the best price and the only way to get the yep. best price is By to get the it. most people through. 100%. So you have to advertise. 100%. Well, we're back. We just had a little technical glitch. Where were you? <laughs> um, oh, you, we were talking about, you know, will you keep selling? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The answer is absolutely. So you I had a moment. I had a moment last year, like really, really, really. Tell me about that. Oh, it was... Um, you know when you're like you've worked your ass off and you get to a point where you're on the front line, you're in the you're forward facing to the general public all of the time, and the perception of real estate to the general public is not great. Mm. And I sort of for about five years after doing quite well, sort of just got a bit over people judging you before they know you. Mm. Social media is a big part of that. Like you'd know what's like, you know, your videos are pretty out there. My videos were used to be jumping in pools and people yeah. just used to think you're a fucking tool. Yeah. And I used to struggle with that, right? You and did. I and Yeah, you gotta you gotta be resilient with You gotta that, be resilient. You put yourself out there though, you're you're you gotta you, you gotta be able to handle the heat. Gonna, not everyone's gonna love you. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well and this is what's interesting, right? So I had a moment where I went to it was it was a build up over about six months mm. where I just got over people being really rude to me at mm. open homes and it I really struggled with it. People Be, were just being rude to you. Just just people. Some people just aren't pleasant yeah, people. Yeah, but, yeah. And they come to your place of work and they start to treat you pretty poorly because you're a real estate agent. They don't know you. And I remember I was at, at an open home and it was like this build up and build up and build up for me where I was like, oh, I just, I'm just over it. Like, I, I don't know if I want to deal with this shit anymore. Like, I don't know, like, I, I, I felt like I'd earned my stripes a little mm-hmm. bit and um, and rightly or wrongly, I don't know, that's how I felt. So, must have been something in it. And um, I remember being at an open home and a buyer came through and the buyer knew my father quite well um, and I'd text dad saying, oh, is this this person you said you trained? And dad's like, yeah, he's a legend. And I was like, yeah, cool. They came through. I was like, went to introduce myself. And I'm still courteous, very courteous around COVID and things. So mm-hmm. I'll ask people, do you shake hands still? Like just to, just in case they're mm-hmm. like, you know, mm-hmm. some people still wear masks yeah. and a bit. Yeah. And um, they said, no, we don't shake hands. And by the way, don't call us. Don't call us. This is your dad's mate. Well, I, I didn't know. Yes. And so, <laughs> Whoa. and it was just this moment and it was just this massive build up for me. Yeah. And anyway, two seconds later, another person who went into the open home, knew them, hugged straight away. 
hug them in the open. And I just text ch- checked with dad again and said, are you sure that's your mate? Like dad's like, yeah, hundred percent. Then on the way out, I said, oh, what do you think? And his wife said, we told you not to call us. We're not interested. And I said, oh, okay, cool. Hey, are you a doctor? And the wife goes, why are you asking that? And I said, because you might know my father, Ray Lancashire. And mouth dropped straight away. And they went to shake my hands. And I went, I don't shake hands. Beat it. And I rang dad after. And this is where I felt really a bit, I felt a bit bad after this because I said to dad, I, I judged the way your, your character based on being friends with fuckheads like that. Like the moment that they knew. How did he know that it, you were his son though at the beginning? He didn't. Oh, so how did you know that it was their, their mate? Because the name came through on the register and I remember my dad talking about this person. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So you just remembered the name. The name of who it was. And okay. I know, because oh, I, yeah. So I knew who the person was. Right. And um, and that I checked with him to see whether it was. Yeah. And um, and anyway, I rang dad after and I was like, oh, mate, I'm starting to judge your character based on being a friend with a person like that. And that was really unfair. The other thing that really, that really scared me about that situation. I remember ringing Hazley was my second call. Mm. I said, I'm done. Buy my shares. I'm fucking out. Mm. I don't I don't want to do this wow. anymore. I'm fucking over it. Oh, man, that was the straw that broke the camel's back, eh? It was it was just a build up yeah. of shit, you uh-huh. know? And um and you work hard. Like yeah. I try every day to try to turn the perception of real estate agents around a transaction mm-hmm. at a time, a call mm-hmm. at a time. Mm-hmm. Because not all real estate agents are bad, you know? And no, the the actual truth of it is that it's an 80-20 rule yeah. in our favour. Yeah. If you're in real estate, there's actually way more good real estate agents than I, bad ones. I agree. There 100% is. I agree. And if you're in it, you'll see it. If you work in an office, you'll see it. Yeah. There's more good than bad. Totally. But the small percentage of bad that there is... Is worse than a lot of and, other things. And, and when they do bad shit, it really stinks. Well, and it makes, it, makes and the it, paper too. Yeah, it's <laughs> like... The the bad ones are the ones you always see, yeah. you know, yeah. and they're so and it's not good. So it's not good. But when you're calling people and you know, and but when people coming into your place of work and treating you like shit, it it, it for me at that point of time yeah. I wasn't ready for it. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I um I went next level, buy my shares, Kush. I'm over it. I don't want to be in this anymore. I'm like I'm done. Anyway, so he said you need to sort that out because it's. I know you don't want to do that. You're a moment of time. So anyway, I went and saw, a, actually went for the first time in my life and it's um, probably got a bit vulnerable with you here, but I went and saw a psychologist, yeah. um, which was the greatest thing I've ever done mm. in my life. Like mm-hmm. the greatest thing I've mm-hmm. ever done. And um, she said to me, cause I told her the whole story mm-hmm. and I was like really emotional about it. Mm-hmm. The reason I saw her though, rewind a bit was because my brain went to a place that I di- it's not in me, right? So yeah. for anyone that knows me and for what I'm about to tell you is they were like, whoa, okay, that's not you. And the first thing when that guy was a fucking prick to me, the first thing I thought in my brain was I'm better than you. I reckon I make more money than you. And I went to a financial thing. Yeah. And that's oh, not me. No, yeah, that is And me. I don't know why. Yeah. And I was like just, you know what, maybe a point to prove and, you know, Treating me like shit, I, I, like I'm better than you. Yeah, and I'm like, whoa, correction. There, I need to correct my brain on that. Yeah, and so I went and saw this lady, mm. and she said to me, she goes, "You think this is about real estate, don't you?" And I said, "Yeah, I do." She goes, "It's not about real estate. Are there bad priests out there? Are there bad lawyers out there? Are there bad police people out there? Are there bad teachers out there?" It's just about people being rude, mm. and the problem that you're doing is you're. You're seeing that you're you're taking offence to it, and you're attacking them back, not coming from a place of empathy. You need to change your brain around mm-hmm. a little bit and rewire your programming mm-hmm. and picture why are they coming to your work and treating you like shit. Mm-hmm. What's going on in their life that they're actually doing that? Mm-hmm. And I was like, it took me a while to think about it. And there was there was, I started doing a lot of reading on it. And there was this um, if anyone wants to listen to it, it's a really good um, convention speech at a university. It was mm. a gentleman by the name of David Foster Wallace, mm-hmm. and it's called This Is Water. And what it's about is you could go, you know, you know, go to a zebra crossing and you deliberately sl- stop for someone and, yeah. you know, and you, you're being really nice and they don't even look at you. Yeah. And, they, and yeah. your first reaction is, oh, yeah, cheers, mate. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, some, someone would beep or something mm-hmm. like that. 
And But imagine just for one second, right, that that person that did that walked across the road could have been a, a victim of domestic violence that, that day. Yeah. Or they've got their, they've, someone close to them has been diagnosed with cancer or something. Uh-huh. 99.9% of the time, they're probably just pricks and they don't care. But that 0.1% of the time, it could be true. And if you thought that everyone was that 0.1%, mm-hmm. you're free, man. Yeah. And you will you will never take those negative – you would always turn those negative things into sort of like a positive thing. Positive thing. Because yeah. what's, what's the alternative? You get yeah. pissed off at people yeah. all the time. Let them ruin your day. But there was a moment, right, which was the, 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 the light bulb moment. And it was like the penny drop was I got picked up by one, uh, an associate that picked me up in the city to drive me back to the office. Mm. And we're driving back on Brunswick Street to turn into our office. And a lady walked across the road and same thing, just mindless, head down. Mm -hmm. And uh, the person who was driving me beat the horn because, and I was like, why'd you beat your horn? Well, could have run her over. Like, mate, she didn't even like, look at her, just mindless, probably a junkie or something. And I said, no, what would I, I go, what would you do if I told you? that her daughter just got diagnosed with breast cancer and had a had breast cut off last week. Would that change your mind? She said, of course it was. And it was true. Her daughter got diagnosed oh, with cancer. Oh, did you know the lady? I knew the lady. Oh, wow. And I was like, holy shit. You know, yeah. that was the one point. Yeah. So anyway, now I've changed my mind to go to another place of mm-hmm. empathy. So if someone treats me like shit, I go to the other side and I go, I oh, wonder what's going on in their life that they're actually like uh, that. Yeah, 100%. And kill them with kindness. And it's actually given me this newfound love for real estate and for people. Oh, bro. I'm glad you figured that out. Yeah. Because it is an absolute game changer. Game changer. Because I honestly think if you are someone who, you know, if someone's re- like just blatantly rude to you for no reason, those people generally are not happy. Not happy. They're not happy people. Yeah. They haven't figured out their own brain yeah you know they haven't figured themselves out and so you know they're lashing out and being rude to other people because that's what makes them feel better because they've had a bad upbringing something's happened something bad has happened yeah. to them yeah and so they're resentful at the world yep. they're resentful about anyone that might be doing better than them yep and you know that's the best way to look at it you know but the other thing is right is you there's so much good shit going on in life like mm. Family, friends, like I got four kids, mm. beautiful kids that mm. are just like, mm-hmm. and you know what? Like, what else do you need? Yeah. Like, and it's like, stop looking at what's better or what's out there or or getting the shits with people that are rude to you. Mm-hmm. Focus in on being mm. a good human, being empathetic to people and what actually could uh, be issues in their life and actually just, you know, be, be a nice person. Mm. And um, so I rang Hazel and said, no, I'm not selling anymore, bro. It's, um, <laughs> keeping my shares. Wow. Well, that's that's cool. I mean, that's just another, uh, you know. But that was bat- last year. Yeah. and Last year. And that's that just shows like the growth that you go through. That wasn't your problem 10 years ago. Your problem was how to get a listing. Now your problem is I've got so many listings and people judge me because I'm, you know, a <laughs> successful agent and they hate agents. You know, that's your problem now. First world problem, yeah, hey? Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. But no, it was a good story and thanks for sharing because, you know getting vulnerable like that and actually getting to a point to say, I'm going to go to a psychologist. Oh, like mate, the best. Psychiatrist? Psychiatrist. Psychologist. Psychologist. Yeah. And that, what's the difference again? I think one, uh, one talks through your issues, one oh, probably shocks And one's probably. like, <laughs> oh, yeah, and one's like, oh, you got bipolar. Yeah. You got a real problem. Probably a few diff- a and different, a little bit more than that. Different spin on it. Yeah, yeah different. <laughs> okay, I didn't explain it. Don't take my thing. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but... Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. And so, do you still go to that? Or was it like, did you do like a couple of sessions? Was it one oh, session? Or I did, did six you... sessions. Six sessions. I like... cover a lot and a lot. Yeah. Like I'm like, for sure. I, I like to go in there and go deep. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. for sure. Well, what's the point if you're not going to go and, full deep? But I do tune ups all the time. You know, like just go and I'll book a, I'll book. Oh mate, if you try to book in with a psychologist, holy moly. Yeah. Mate, they are very difficult to get into. And um, I do it for a tune-up, like just to go on, you know, a sounding board and have a mm-hmm. chat, mm-hmm. Which, I, which I find mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. And you know what? It used to be a thing of, oh, why would you tell anyone that you've seen a psychologist? And it's like, because it's, it's, it's fine. It's like fine. Everyone's it's... got challenges in life, mate. Like, yeah. yeah. And it's like, I think we're moving past that part in the world where it's like, you know, it's embarrassing to go to a psychologist. I think it's brave. I think it is brave. It's very brave. I think it's even brave talking about it mm. because it's like... It's even braver. 
yeah. to talk about it and share that yeah. and encourage someone who might be having a hard time to take that. Totally. Take that. You know, and I've sent so many himself. people to this lady, and mm. um, it's ama- it's amazing. You don't know what's going on behind closed doors. You no, know what I mean? Sure. And it's um, and in a time like this, it's I just find you know what's happening in the market with everything. It's at the moment is bizarre. It's, it just mm. seems like the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And there's this, uh, there's so many things that are going on. Divorce at the moment, like mm-hmm. unfortunately, I'd say fifty percent of some of my business is based on that. Wow, which is not That's a lot, not eh? great, mm, not, not great. good. Not good. The stats seem to be keep going up more and more. Yeah. Mate, um, we've taken a, a, a good chunk of time and I want to talk about your profile a bit more because, you know, I remember when I saw you at, I was about 26 and I was at that three to 500 stage and really struggling to get past. And I saw you at a career mail event and there was like James Curtin up on stage. You were up on stage. You were 30, I remember. Is that the convention center? Uh, yeah, it was. Oh, yeah. It was at the yeah. convention center. And I, I was like, I really want to talk to Matt. Like, and I grabbed you I remember. afterwards. Do you remember? I do remember. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I and I was like, oh, hey, mate, like, can you tell me I'm just really struggling to get past yeah. three to 500. I've been stuck here for two years. And you just said, how's your profile? And I was like, <laughs> I don't know. And you're like, work on your profile. Everyone needs to know who you are. Work on your profile. And you walked off. And I was like, you didn't have much time. You weren't being rude. I was very gracious for that one line. And I was like, wow, okay. Went back and I I took some steps and it really worked. But I want to know, like, tell the audience, what did you mean by that? Like, oh, I just think real estate and the tools we use are evolving all the time. Mm. So... Uh, print was my sort of springboard. Mm-hmm. Um, print is still very relevant to me today. Um, but then I saw a shift, a decline in print. This is about five years ago. Mm-hmm. And it was when Instagram started mm-hmm. to, you know, Facebook was mm-hmm. sort of getting pushed aside. Instagram was going up. And I remember talking to Hazley and he's like, because he'd see me on Insta. And he'd be like, get off that shit. You know, it's yeah. like, and anyone at that point in time, they thought it was just like, a, you know, it was just for social media, not for business. And I saw something in that years ago where I thought, you know what, if prints decline, that's all I know. Mm. What's my next thing? And I went like hard into socials, mm. right? And it's evolved a lot now. Mm. And it's and like your social media uh, profile is awesome. And it's like you've got your own thing. Yep. Like you run your own race. Yep. And you know what? And I, I love the fact that you just run at it. Yeah. And it's like <laughs> because what – what a lot of people do is they'll go on and go, I want to build a social media profile. Oh, they'll do one or two posts. Oh, it didn't work. I don't get anything. Yeah. It takes time. Ages. Ages. And then now with the changing of the algorithms yeah. and everything like that, it's it's um it's it's getting more more and more challenging. Yeah. Like your followers like just sitting Yeah. The, that, the, <laughs> the the organic views are just hard dropping hard. You have to pay a lot more. Yeah. Like they they figured it out, didn't they? They did. But what I – so what I mean by that, it doesn't matter what market you're in. You've got to work out what your market likes. Yeah. And whether it's domain, whether it's realestate.com, whether it's mm-hmm. social, whether it's print, mm-hmm. whether it's the local publication of that marketplace, whether it's billboards, whether it's signs or whatever it might be, you need to be seen mm-hmm. all of the time. I agree. And so you're quite big on social media and I saw a change in your page like – I can almost pinpoint the time when you started doubling down yep. and you were going, no, nah, I'm going to go hard at this. Because yep. you weren't doing it really. No. Like probably before maybe 2019. Yeah. Maybe. Yep. And then all of a sudden it was like Just every property and yep. really good quality yep. videos and stuff like that. And you got in there early, which was which was important. Um, but like I'm sure a lot of people look at you and go, Oh yeah, well it's easy to do social media because all these houses are worth three million plus. Yeah. You know, it's easy to make a nice video. You just need a nice house. I sell mid-range seven hundred and fifty k houses. Yeah. If you were selling that sort of property, would you still do social media? Hundred percent. What would you do? Okay, prime example of that is just go and look at Josh Teslin's page down in Quakers Hill. Mm-hmm. Like he's the Ray White International number one agent. Mm-hmm. His average sale price is about eight hundred thousand dollars, but he just sells three hundred fifty yeah. fifty of them a yeah. year. Um, and his isn't glamorous. He just does it. Yeah, and it works for him. And it's like so you've got to work out what your market likes, mm. though, because you could be you could be trying to do the three million dollar or four million dollar 
production on a seven hundred thousand dollar house, and that market doesn't like it. Mm. You've got to be a chameleon to your market. Mm-hmm. So if I was selling seven hundred, eight hundred, another great example is uh, Beck Kuderman. Um, you know, oh, she, yeah. she, another Ray, Ray White, White agent. She yeah. her average sale price is around you know eight. To a million, yeah, and she's nailing it yeah. down there, like mm-hmm. doing really well, high volume sort of agent. Mm-hmm. Um, you've just got to be a chameleon to what your market likes. And do you know what? I'd post. Uh, I got to a point where I would be. You've got to stop caring, yeah, because I'd I'd look at my videos and I go, oh, I don't know if I want to post that, and then you just don't post it. But then you post it later, or someone posts it for you, and it's the best engagement you've ever yeah. had. Yeah, and you're like, what the hell? Why? Yeah, exactly. It's funny how that works. Sometimes you think, oh, this one's going to get heaps of views, and it, and it nothing. Bombs. And then you post one that I didn't 100%. think. Like it's like that tax video. I don't know if you saw the tax video. Yeah, I did. That, that was like my biggest hit ever. Yeah, and that was sitting on my computer for three years because you didn't want to post. I it. I didn't want to post it because it was a little bit just out there. But then it was tax time. I was like, oh, this will be funny. Just like, and I just posted it, and it went, went off. bonkers. 100%. But it, it, it went bonkers because it relates to every single person. Yeah. But but that's, um, but that's what you show. need to do. You yeah. need to give relatable content mm. to people. And yeah. do you know what? Most people will sit there and overthink it and then just not post. And then not do and it. And it's about consistency of it. I went through a bit of a stage where I was like, oh, I'm off this a bit. Like I just – I. I don't like putting myself. My wife hates it. She hates putting like mm. like. I think it's like she hates all the putting the kids and yeah, stuff like that. Putting your life on it. But then it is actually my life. Mm. Like, and it's like I want to be authentic to my life, sure. and I don't want to. I don't sit there and I go, oh, I'm going to schedule a post for a family portrait in two weeks' time because I want everyone to see my family. Yeah. None of that. Yeah. It's more like, hey, I want to post something like my kid at school today. It was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Like, I'm proud of them. Yeah. And that's where it becomes more authentic. Mm-hmm. As soon as you're not being authentic to yourself, your audience won't think you're authentic. And do you know what? You got to realize that people don't won't like you, regard or, or they'll love you or they won't like yeah. you. And I've had mates of mine like um, unfollow, and I'll write, I'll write, I'll see an unfollow just randomly. I don't monitor it, yeah. But I'll see an unfollow and I'll send it to them. And they're like, yeah, mate, I'm just not digging the. I don't. And they're my <laughs> mate. Mate, how funny is it when you first do, and, and everyone out there who's going to try social media, I'll give you some advice, right? When you first do your first videos, everyone's going to go, mate, awesome. You'll get likes from all your friends and family. And then you do your second one and about half of them will I'm, like it. Yeah. And about five to ten videos in, none of your friends <laughs> and none of your family like any of your and shit. And you feel like texting them going, oh, can you just like him, please? I don't even ask. I just know that's the that's the devil yeah. of the beast. It's so true, it's though. Your friends and family and everyone that's close to you get sick of the, your shit. The one thing you should definitely not do with social media is go on and find out who's not following you back that you're following. Oh, don't do I haven't it. done that. Don't do it. I'm not going to do it. Don't you do put it, it in my head now. Go don't on. do it. All right, I'm not going to do it. I'll, You'll be I'll, like, I might I need only to followed see, you I might because I felt bad. Afterwards. And then they've unfollowed you. Yeah. Yeah, it's all good. But no, that's that's you just got to be a chameleon to whatever your market is. Yeah, you do. And it doesn't have to be just about the houses. You know, it's about how, getting involved in the community, talk about the new thing that's happening at the school, go down to the school fate. Like it's getting involved. It's got to be authentic. It's got to be authentic, 100%. Yeah, if you want to be in a community and you want to do well in your community, You've got to actually show your community that you are a yeah, part of it. Yeah. 100%. And it's not like about the, you know, oh, oh, I'm posting, I'm at the school fate, give me a listing because yeah. I deserve the right to get a listing because I'm at the school fate. That's not what it is. Well, yeah, if you just go take a photo at the school fate and you leave, you're not getting anything out of it. You 100%. know, you take a photo at the school fate, you stick around at the fate and you meet everyone and you, and you do... have some genuine conversations. And then that person then later sees that photo and then connects the two and goes, I like that guy. 100%. Yeah. But that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Agreed. Mate, you talked about your kids. You have four kids. <laughs> yeah. That's insane. That's hectic because I've got one and I'm already – like contemplating how can we handle two? Two's easier. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, no, because you're so – everything you do like with the first kid, it's the first time. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you put the kid down, have a sleep, and then it's not moving. So you tap it 50 times to make sure it's still breathing. <laughs> like all of those things, like you just you, – you become better. Yeah. And, you know, you, you probably overthink the first one. It's like this photo I've seen once before. It's like first child – the bedroom's got all bunting on the walls and painting yeah, and draft. Yeah, that's us and right then now. Then you go third sure. child and it's a mattress on the floor. 
And I was the third child, so I had the long sleeves of everything, <laughs> like, mismatched. I was just... I All did, the hand-me-downs. Yeah. I yeah, but it's, um, look, it, it is challenging, but I've mm. got a really great support network at home. My wife's amazing. She's an unbelievable mother. Um, and, look, four kids is it, has got its complexities as well. Um, you know, school sport. Is That's, a big one. Mate, it's it's huge. Like the amount of time you have to give up the sacrifice, the new sacrifice to get to be able to be there as well, a dad as much as you well, can. Well, the hardest you know? one of the hardest things for me now is I love we we spend a lot of time at the Gold Coast and um like school sports now Saturday and Sundays. And it's like you make a choice. You well, I've been on the coast in four weeks mm. and it's like but that's just what it is, and mm-hmm. that's probably going to be the next ten years. Mm-hmm. So you know, I've got nine year old, a seven year old, a five year old, and a one year old. Wow! So it's um, it's pretty it's full on, pretty wild. So how home. do you do? Do you have a daily routine? Do you, like health and fitness is yeah. really important for big, you. Big time. What's your and and are you really strict with all that? Yeah, very. So well, how does I, that look? So I manage my life in in three buckets. Mm. Everything I do is I always talk about the buckets. One of them, which is pro- my most important one, which is my relationships, which mm-hmm. is family, children, um, close mates and work colleagues. So that's one of my buckets, right? And I always work on doing things that, you know, fulfill those, what I want to do in those bu- mm-hmm. that bucket. The second one is uh, health and fitness. Mm-hmm. So, and, and mindfulness is one of the big parts of that. And when you hit sort of 40, I'm 43 now, when you hit that age, restoration is a big one as mm-hmm. well and recovery. Mm-hmm. So it's, um so... That's a big. That's a big thing. I'm. I actually feel better at 43 than I did it at 23 at the moment. Literally, that's, that's awesome. Feel amazing. That's great. And it's um. So everything's all sh- scheduled with that. Like I'm training for a marathon at the moment. I make sure like I do everything. My nutrition's amazing. My yeah. sleep's great. You know, not drinking, doing all the things that will get me feeling good and running. Yeah. And when yeah. I do that as a sense of accomplishment, I feel really good about yeah. it. Um, so, and I'm not suggesting anyone that's in their sort of learning phase, breakthrough phase, sacrifice stage do this. Um, but what I've, what's really important to me is spending time with my wife and my family and mm-hmm. my kids. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I've done is I've been able to fortunate enough that a couple of days a week I do a training at lunchtime. Yeah. So I'll, I'll get up early in the morning. I'll, I'll feed all the kids. I'll do all of that. I'll get them all off to school. So I drop them to school most days. Um, and then I'm super productive from 8.30 till 12, then I train, and then I have my lunch, and then from 1.30 till 7, I'm super productive again. Yeah, nice. I try to get home three nights a week to have dinner with the kids as mm-hmm. well, um, mm-hmm. and obviously on weekends, so, but three working days, which is like, it's still hard. Yeah. Um, and um, so I'm very, very mindful of that. Um, and then obviously the third one is wealth uh, creation, business and investments is yeah. another big thing. What I found a few years ago, right, is I've sort of, I feel like for myself, I've I've sorted it. I used to try to be 110% in every bucket, right? Yeah. But what I'd find is I could do two of the buckets exceptionally well and one would fail yeah. dramatically. Yeah. So I'd either be business was unbelievable, I had a good rig and everything was feeling good, <laughs> but my family was suffering. Yeah. Or... Um, I was, I was really good with the family. My, uh, fitness was really shit. Uh, and shit rig. yeah. And just, you know, and I could only manage two of the three really well. What I've decided to do. And I think it's when you hit sort of 40, you're close to that. You'll, you know, you're, hey, mate, we don't need to talk about that. Though. But what happens is in my thirties, in your thirties still, I mean, I'm in my 30s, three, yeah. <laughs> what I find is you can't be a hundred percent all the time. So I've dropped everything back to 80%. Okay. And by yeah. doing that to 80%, mate, oh, my buckets are full, mate. My That's buckets great. buckets are full. Yeah. And Trying to be 100% in every bucket all the time, it's virtually impossible. Isn't well, it's hard as yeah. well. Like with, you know. with work now, we've got four officers, 160 staff. So we're doing – that's a, a full-time thing. That's – yeah. And four kids at home and yeah. then, you know, busy, busy home life is crazy. And then trying to fit in fitness and everything around that – is it's it looks really difficult, but when you have it like I, I've effectively moved my ideal week into every part of my life. Yeah. So I've literally yeah. will set. If you look at my calendar, uh, Mariana, who's my EA, she'll go and put every training thing in to my diary, so it's not so I don't deviate from yeah. it, yeah. don't miss any sessions, yeah. all the times allocated for, and so I can do it, you and just, it feels great. Yeah, 
You're not, it's not on the fly anymore. Not it's, on the fly. Yeah. yeah, it's not like, oh, I should do a quick run here. Yeah. It's in my diary. It's in the diary. Yeah. yeah. And I find it, I've, I'm so, I do Pilates twice a week now. Jeez. Mate, it's unbelievable. You in a room full of girls. No, I do a private <laughs> session because I'm not that good. It's embarrassing. Um, and, but I'm just so consistent with it because it's locked, the time is locked away and I haven't missed a session. Yeah. So and it, it may, it's good for them. It's good for me. Yeah. Because it's all, all squared away and I don't change it. I, I Every appointment that I book, I want to make sure that I fulfill that obligation of that appointment. So don't deviate from it because I hate it when people cancel stuff on me. Oh, it's one of the worst it's things. Like your and podcast you this morning, <laughs> you checking in? I was checking in. I was like, this guy's a busy guy. Is he going to throw in the towel last no, minute? Mate, no, I knew you wouldn't. Ready you to roll. Wouldn't. Absolutely. Mate, this has been absolutely awesome. Thanks for being the authentic you. Um, you know, you love to share and, and help others to, you know, get to where they need to be. I, I got heaps out of that. I'm sure everyone did. I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Dan. Brother. Cheers, mate. No appreciate worries. it. Thank you for tuning into the Get Keen podcast. If today's episode inspired you, please show your support with a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And make sure you subscribe on your favorite platform too. Don't stop there. Join our community of forward thinkers by connecting with me on social media at Dan underscore Lee underscore Plum. I'm looking forward to exploring more strategies and insights with you on your journey to the top. Until next time, keep getting keen.